I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today and uh, also delighted as the Executive Director of Orchestras Canada to be able to offer what I'm going to describe as the very first event in this year's national conference. As some of you will recall, we were planning on holding our national conference in Hamilton, Ontario this year between the 20th of May and the 22nd of May. For obvious reasons, that's not able to happen. And instead, what we've been doing is a lot of work and a lot of thinking behind the scenes to figure out how we can connect you, how we can inform you, how we can engage you with uh, some of the things that you might be most interested in knowing about exactly right now. So um, this is a, a sneak peek of the conference that uh, <laughs> isn't going to happen, um, but we will be offering programming under the title Relaunch between now and December 2020 to try to replace uh, what we were going to be offering and to enrich it to be even more responsive to the things that you currently want to know. So when we began to do some thinking about the kinds of questions that people were asking right now, it became very clear that all of your concerns were around how best to stay in touch with your patrons, how best to manage those incredibly important relationships, even as you're dealing with internal stakeholders, your musicians, your staff, your boards, you know that it's so very important to maintain contact with uh, the people who make it possible for your orchestra to exist, uh, the donors and the ticket buyers. And as I began to contemplate, uh, and as I began to look at some of what was going on um, across the, the internet, I decided to call in an old friend an old friend to Orchestras Canada, uh, and an old friend to me personally. Um, our dear former board chair, Jeff Alexander, formerly of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, where he was president and CEO for uh, an exceptionally wonderful period in that organization's life, um, but now currently serving as president and CEO of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And I approached Jeff about the prospect of talking with our group uh, about what the CSO is doing to stay in touch with its patrons, uh, ticket buyers as well as donors, through this period of time. And Jeff suggested that he might want to bring on uh, two of his brilliant colleagues to supplement what he had to say. So with no further ado, I'll pass the baton to Jeff. Thank you, Catherine. And hello, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Uh, some familiar faces and many who I'm meeting for the first time. Very good to be with you. Um, yes, when, when Catherine contacted me a couple of weeks ago asking if I would uh, participate in, in an event like this to talk about specifically uh, staying in touch with donors and, uh, and uh, subscribers and ticket holders and patrons in general, uh, my immediate reaction was yes, um, because I, uh, I'll do anything for Orchestras Canada. Uh, I learned so much uh, through my uh, 14 years affiliation with uh, with OC, um, uh, but I did make one condition, and that would be that I could uh, bring along uh, Ryan Lewis and Dale Heading, our, our VPs for marketing and sales and development, um, considering the topic at hand. They both are far more expert at these topics than I am. Um, they're both um, quite excellent uh, in, in the work they do. They, they, they're, they're great. Uh, when we were under uh, normal operations, and as, as uh, I thought they would, they've risen to the occasion quite brilliantly in this uh, quite bizarre set of circumstances we all find ourselves in. So I just wanted to give a general greeting to everyone uh, today. I'll be happy to pipe in uh, from time to time if there's a question that I feel uh, I, I can answer. As, as well as Ryan or Dale, perhaps. But uh, I think for the most part, considering the topic, uh, I, I'm putting you in very good hands with, uh, with Ryan Lewis and, and Dale Heading. Uh, so thank you, good to be with you, and uh, look forward to the next hour. Great, thank you, Jeff, thank you, Ryan, thank you, Dale. So we've worked up some questions that I'm going to pose to Ryan, Dale, and or Jeff. Uh, and we also have time at the end uh, of the session to uh, take questions from the floor that we'll ask you to submit through the chat box where and Nick has explained where that is. You can certainly um, ask him for help if you need any assistance with that. So I'm going to pose the questions 
and I'll watch for a, um, a, a break in the action to move on to the next one, but I want to make sure that our guests have plenty of time to, to respond. So I framed this session um, as essentially being an exploration of how to stay in touch with ticket buyers, donors, and past, current, and future friends of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to ensure a rapturous and resilient relaunch when the time is right. So I'm going to start with uh, a question I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear the answer to, a pair of questions really. Gentlemen, what are you doing that is working? What has been less than successful? Why do you think this is? And how are you pivoting? So what's working? What's not working? How are you responding? Well, Catherine, first of all, thank you. Uh, we are thrilled to be here and excited to share with our colleagues what we're all learning and working on. And as you said, pivoting, that is a key word in these times, uh, as we are learning every day. Um, I wanted to share with everyone, as, as Ryan and I and Jeff share some concepts of what we're working on, what we're doing. Uh, we also want to be clear, we recognize that orchestras, Canada, there's a wide range of resources and sizes. Um, and we've been very thoughtful at what we're going to talk about. And we want to make sure everyone understands that uh, almost everything we're going to talk about are really based on solid best practices and fundamentals we should all be doing regardless of size. Um, and you're going to hear a lot of um, examples of good and frequent communications, constant engagement, you know, inspiring messages uh, at this time. Um, and most importantly, um, calls to action are critical to success right now, particularly in a crisis mode, uh, but always. So as we talk about different elements and activities, we want to be clear that for, for all of us, um, the only question is how you scale these practices to your own size or staff or budgets. Uh, it really shouldn't be a question of whether or not any of us should be doing them. We should be doing all of these kinds of things. We just need to make it work for our own types of organizations. And so Ryan is going to get us started here with some of the things that are working for our organization. Thanks, Dale. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit first just about communication. And before we can talk about communicating with our patrons and donors, the most important thing is that we're communicating well amongst ourselves, starting with the staff. Um, our team was not used to be working remotely all the time, so it's been a major adjustment for us to each be uh, under stay-at-home orders and having to connect virtually like we all are today. Um, so one thing that we made sure that we could do was communicate through a virtual um, experience like Zoom. Uh, we're using Microsoft Teams primarily um, in our office right now. Um, but we've primarily kept our regular schedule of staff meetings, making sure that every team um, is communicating regularly, keeping things on schedule, everyone knows what's going on, and trying to keep the team motivated. Our department heads, um, led by Jeff, our president, we actually have daily team meetings every single morning uh, where the department heads check in, talk about uh, what, need, what problems need to be solved, what's happening in everyone's departments, making sure that communication is, is moving smoothly ahead. We've also um, then talked about our external communications, that it's important that we maintain communication with all of our key stakeholders, um, primarily the musicians of our orchestra. Um, we have the musicians of our Chicago Symphony Chorus, um, our Civic Orchestra of Chicago, our Board of Trustees, all of our donors, and various volunteer groups. And then we think about our patrons, our ticket holders, our donors, and the, the larger CSOA family, and how do we communicate with each of those groups individually. Um, Jeff is great, and every time we have a big announcement, he sends a, a tailored email to each of those groups with an update from the company. Uh, we've also been in touch with um, colleagues across our industry. Um, so I know Dale had a, a group of colleagues that are the heads of development at major orchestras across the country. Um, I've also been participating with marketing heads of major orchestras across the US. And we're keeping in regular contact just about what we're seeing in each of our own cities and how we're seeing similarities and differences in our own local markets. And then I also have been keeping in touch with my marketing colleagues um, at other cultural organizations in the city of Chicago to find out how um, each organization, whether it's an opera company, a symphony, a, a theater, or a museum, how we're all dealing with the same challenges in our hometown. Dale, back to you. And then we're also, one of the things that's working is we're, we're checking the temperature of our patrons and constituents often. I mean, imagine where we were all were three weeks ago. Um, so checking in with everyone's perception, their moods, uh, the perceptions of how their own personal resources have been impacted 
And again, it's changing frequently. So nothing is a done deal on the first pass. I mean, two weeks later, the trustees are more comfortable with than where we were. So are we. Uh, patrons and donors are willing to re-engage so much more now, you know, a month into this than they were. So rechecking and understanding exactly where we stand has been a really critical piece for us. And when we think about our patrons or ticket holders, um, one of the most important things that we've uh, focused on is offering patrons flexibility during uncertain times. So we've adjusted all of our communications to acknowledge the situation. We don't want to appear tone deaf. As many of you uh, were sort of are going through this, we're in a similar situation where we had launched our subscription campaign for the 2020-21 season. And we're right in the middle of that and we're getting close to our renewal deadlines before the coronavirus situation hit. So we've had to sort of, you know, put the brakes on, think about what can we do to adjust our messaging, adjust our deadlines, and really work with our patrons to provide them the flexibility that they needed. Um, we at the CSO are in a very unique situation in that um, last year, um, you probably are aware that we had a strike um, with our musicians that lasted for seven weeks and we had seven weeks of canceled concerts and events. Um, this year, um, the concert cancellations came almost one year to the day of when, what we went through last year. So I would say that as challenging as the strike was, uh, it did provide us sort of a I would say a learning opportunity for going through something very similar this year. And we've kind of uh, resurrected some of the crisis communications tools and things that we had, had learned and, and developed over the last year. So for our patrons, um, it's important for us to be in contact with them. And primarily we're in touch through many channels, um, email, um, phone calls, uh, voice blasts, you name it. And um, for ticket holders that had tickets to canceled concerts, um, we're providing them multiple options of what to do with their tickets. So one option is to exchange into a future concert. Um, customers can also put the money on account for a future purchase, whether it's this year or towards a subscription for next year. Um, they can ask for a refund, but the number one um, choice that we're trying to promote is that they consider converting the value of their tickets into a tax deductible donation. And we're now building a campaign around this option as our sort of preference for the organization. And this is an example we'll talk in a little bit about how development and marketing are working so well together on this effort. Um, on our subscription campaign, uh, again, we are trying to find ways to offer more flexibility. So we've looked at our renewal deadlines. We're sort of extending the deadlines uh, more than in a traditional campaign. Um, we are waiving our handling fees for subscribers that uh, renew by a particular date. Uh, we're also trying to offer extended monthly payment plans for people that might be having hardships right now to allow more uh, flexibility in paying over a longer period of time. Um, the other thing I would say that, that's um, working really well, we talked a little bit about just how we're communicating with our staff and internal colleagues. And we're really relying on technology. So Microsoft Teams um, has come in to be very uh, helpful. Um, Zoom, which we're using right now. Uh, one, we're trying to keep things light also a little bit. So one thing we started was a digital water cooler on Teams um, to have some sort of uh, fun uh, to keep things a little bit lighthearted uh, during these challenging times. So right now, uh, the current thread on our digital water, water cooler is everyone's posting photos of their pets at home. So we can see all the pets of, of CSO staff members and, and join in some fun. Um, something else we're thinking about in terms of communicating with our staff in a larger way outside of email and, and meetings is actually um, next week, uh, Jeff is planning to lead a virtual town hall uh, with members of our staff um, through Zoom. And that's something that we actually did um, in person last year during the strike. We brought the entire administration together on several occasions um, to allow people to come together and ask questions of our leadership. So we're gonna plan that, but do it virtually next week. And one other just final short uh, point I'll make here, you know, early on, one of the things I learned, you know, one of the areas where we, I struggled a little bit, um, within the first few days, it became clear the volume of messaging was gonna become overwhelming. Um, it, what we had to put out to the public, to our constituents, to the staff teams, uh, and it really challenged the normal hierarchy, right. certainly that we have in our, these two large departments, marketing and development. Uh, so very early on, it became clear that I could not handle all of that. 
So I had to elevate some of my development team to make them the point people with Ryan's team. And Ryan's gonna talk about that momentarily. Um, but I had to move some people around. So they were point people on a lot of these key issues coming back and telling me what was going on so we could make group decisions. And to facilitate this, um, we created in development, which I've used many times in my career, um, this sort of crisis communication kit. Um, and it gets updated daily by my team, working with Ryan's team, but it really is almost just a kit the entire development team can take and just pull right from it, list of the most current content that marketing has pushed out in social media and our activities, list of recent articles of relevance, um, recommended talking points, um, and we call them points of encouragement and then broad case statement points um, that the development team can be using in their quick emails and direct mail preparations and phone conversations with donors. Um, so this has really been a little bit of a game changer for me and the machine flows much more smoothly with this in place. Um, so, Catherine, I think that's where we are in this section. Great. Okay. Well, I, I could sense the segue being set up for me um, very, very tastefully. Because uh, my next question is, and you've already started to allude to it, how are you coordinating between marketing and development departments when there's so much to do and you're not even working in the same space? And that goes back to our staff communication that I started talking about earlier, about how we're all trying to stay in touch with one another um, using these virtual tools. So it's important that even though we are a large organization, I think we have about 100 um, staff uh, members of the, of the association, um, it's important, especially on the marketing and development side, to break down silos. That we're all one big revenue generating team and that we all have an important relationship to manage with our, our patrons. Um, we don't think about people as ticket buyers versus donors, they are our patrons and we all have to, to manage that relationship and work together. Um, so a couple things that we do, um, we have a, a marketing PR strategy group um, where the heads of the marketing and communications team meet regularly to just talk about how are we steering uh, the communication strategy for the organization. And then we have a cross-departmental uh, social media team that's been very active, especially right now, in developing digital content. And that social media team um, is comprised of members of the marketing team, of development, communications and the institute which is our educational department um, they had it used to be weekly meetings but um, while we've been in this period they've actually been meeting sometimes twice a week sometimes more and they've been brainstorming content ideas um, sort of vetting ideas we have a shared uh, content calendar and work with a digital uh, marketing agency that then helps us sort of publish and promote that content on our social media channels so everything is, is planned out in advance. Um, we decide what content should uh, live organically on social media and what should have those advertising dollars behind it to promote to a wider audience. Uh, in addition to social media, um, we think a lot about our email communications to our patrons. So every email that we send um, is planned in a shared calendar that's shared between our two departments um, with coordinated messaging. Every uh, email list that we pull is segmented and um, uh, use personally inf personal information to, um, to, to sort of uh, make sure that email is, has the right message to the right customer at the right time. We also, um, in the last year, launched an online proofing system that's been a game changer. So everything that we're producing, whether it's an email, a video, um, a print piece, goes into this online proofing system. So members of both departments have an opportunity to review the content make sure sponsorship information is correct, uh, crediting, uh, making sure the tone of voice is correct. So many, many eyes on proofs. And um, we also work very closely with our de development colleagues um, in use of our data. So um, like many of you on this call, you might uh, use a um, system called Tessitura as our CRM. And what's uh, fantastic about Tessitura is it lets us look at the full relationship of, of the patron to the association has all of their ticket history, development, fundraising activity, all in one system. Um, so we actually have several cross-departmental teams um, that use Tessitura, and, and we've been keeping those meetings going virtually. Um, so one is our Tessitura and Web Priorities Group, where we meet um, once a week to talk through the priorities of what changes we'd like to make to the database, how we're using it, what customizations need to be made. And then we've also recently started a new weekly analytics meeting. Um, for those of you that know Tessitura, they recently launched a new platform called Tessitura Analytics, 
uh, business intelligence suite um, that's built within the software. And we've just been starting to sort of roll that out um, to provide training to our staff and to develop um, shared dashboards and widgets. So in, an, in a sort of unusual way, um, having this sort of time and space now without um, concerts every single night has given us the space to have the staff sort of work on this new tool and learn it to improve our, our reporting capabilities. So it sounds as though you were already a long way down the road of, uh, of building those, those strong communication protocols between the departments. Uh, I suppose I'm, I'm just being a bit saucy here because I'm, I'm going to throw something in. Um, is it intensified through this period of time and would you ever go back to how it was before? I think it has intensified a little bit, but I think Dale and I really set the tone from the beginning that our departments need to be, work hand in hand. Um, and that's how we should be working as colleagues. Um, I've been in other companies where sometimes marketing is fighting against development. It's very siloed. You're fighting over how you're going to communicate with patrons. Um, and I come from a very sort of opposite point of view that even at a large institution, we have to make sure that our, our departments are working hand in hand and making sure that all of our communications are aligned and coordinated. And, and one of the things this period has done, it has forced our hands on some of the things Ryan and I have been talking about for the few months since I've been here. Now we just had to do them because we didn't have any other way to communicate. So we've moved into this more video and more active and pushing the agenda more quickly. So in some ways, yeah, I don't think we want to go back. I think this has forced us to move where we wanted to move. And I think um, Dale and I are actually both relatively new to the organization. Um, Dale started, I believe, in December, if that's right. right. Feels like ages ago. Um, <laughs> and I started just over a year ago. And I think both of us have really tried to change the culture and the way that our departments operate. Because we are so large, our departments actually span three different floors in our office building. So some of it, um, you know, when we were in the office was making sure that we would have FaceTime with our other team members and making sure people visit other floors or have meetings on different floors. And now we're actually communicating in a very different way. Great. Thank you. So I want to move on to the next question, if I may. Uh, and that is, with frontline healthcare being understandably the focus of so much public and philanthropic attention, how do you make the case for an orchestra without seeming tone deaf at this particular point? Right, and that's a great question, Catherine, because look, this is a serious issue for us, but I will be uh, unapologetic in my responses here and, and, and say that there, there are many people for whom what we do, classical music orchestras, is their top or one of their top three priorities, and, and it's our job, you know, we've got to activate this group immediately. And, and remember too, all of those other, um, I say in quotes, more urgent or critical issues, healthcare, hunger, homelessness, unemployment, they all have their own armies of advocates who are gonna take every dollar off the table to support their efforts because they believe in them. And we are those advocates for our organizations. Uh, and um, if we can't get people fired up and excited about what we do, who else will? So in some ways I see this as our charge and our calling and our cause. Um, I believe in all those other things, but, but I also believe, you know, those places all have their fervent supporters and advocates as well. Um, so we really don't need to apologize for being the best advocates for what we're doing. And I think we have to acknowledge, we know there are people that are in very bad financial situations, but there are many who are not. Um, and there are many who care deeply about our orchestras uh, and are most inspired right now to help us ensure that the orchestras remain healthy. And we moved into this absolute cardinal rule of fundraising too. Never say no for the donor. We really don't get to try to presuppose. They'll tell us, and, or you know some that you just can't go to now, but others will just tell you it's not the right time. But we're seeing such a strong response. So many want to help. And remember also, I mean, it's, sounds a little bit cynical, but there are a lot of people that are in this category of what I call their event or special campaign givers. And that's a nice way of saying, you know, some people like to step up in a crisis, earthquake, hurricane, orchestra budget crises. Um, there are some people that need to see a heroic situation to want to step in and help. Um, boy, we have that now. So we need to find those people as well. Um, and we also need to be careful. We can't discount um, those groups and be overly sensitive against all the other people that want to help. 
So I would, I would say, you know, donors, they really want to know, they want to hear from us now on what our biggest challenges are, um, honest assessments of our current situation, but very important, only as a prelude to a forward-looking message on how their support now will help us, will solve our challenges, will help us move forward to relaunching. And I love your title, Catherine, relaunching, you know, when we're done with this, we, we all need to come out of this presenting great orchestras again as quickly as possible. And so that's a good message now to take to people. Okay, um, I, I might you got me. In, if, I may, if I may, Catherine, I might pipe in. Um, that, you know, we should never lose sight as orchestra managers that uh, the services that we support, uh, the services that we provide to the community are, are so incredibly life enriching. Uh, and and uh, the people who experience our concerts, um, the concerts are very important to their lives. I, you all know this, but um, I think in a situation like this, or I, I remember, you know, any any time there'd be a, a catastrophe, uh, you know, a tsunami, or a, as Jan said, an earthquake, or some terrible episode that happened somewhere in the world. You know, sometimes I would feel we would feel a little guilty continuing our fundraising campaigns in that environment. But the, the services that we provide, the people who live in our communities. Um, are very, very important and uh, enabling people to come hear concerts, which we can't do right now, of course, but we'll, we'll be able to again. Uh, that's such a meaningful event in their lives that uh, as Dale is saying, we, we shouldn't be shy in continuing to ask these people who you know love our organizations and love the art form uh, to continue to support us, uh, not only even during this time, but in particular during this time. Where do I send my check? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll call you later. <laughs> <laughs> you know where to find me. Uh, so I want to uh, move on to next question, which is how are you working with the CSO musicians uh, to keep the organization viable? I already know that you are. Um, I follow you on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and I've seen the cat playing Bolero uh, with its beautiful white paws. Um, how are you doing it? What's, what's, what's the process for identifying content and uh, deciding what to share? Yeah, um, it's so important for us to maintain a connection with our audiences while we can't be together at, co at concerts. Um, at first, I would say it took us a while to figure out our strategy and to generate content. Um, everyone, including staff, musicians, everyone was in shock and needed a few days to sort of process what was going on in the world. Um, there was a big concern about the content that we created, that it needed to be at the, qual at a, the quality level that was appropriate for our organization. Um, we were struggling in that we didn't have permissions or the rights to share a lot of our longer form content on social media platforms. And every day that went by on social media without new content felt like an eternity. So the marketing and communications team really had to shift gears and transition from promoting concerts to creating and promoting digital content. We reminded ourselves that this is gonna be a marathon, not a sprint. So we needed to think about this carefully, be strategic about our content, and develop a schedule and a cadence of how frequently we would release new videos. Uh, we established a core digital content group acting as uh, liaisons between our musicians and the staff. Uh, that group consists of one staff member on our PR team, uh, one musician, member of our flute section, and our photographer and videographer who actually is an independent contractor. And the three of them have been sort of collecting and brainstorming ideas and making it pass seamlessly between musicians and staff. Uh, we sent out an invitation to all members of the orchestra asking them to sort of volunteer and submit what we call DIY videos or you know, do-it-yourself videos um, to keep our audiences connected with their artistry and creativity. Um, we were very clear that the DIY video content would be considered for posting, but not all content submitted would appear on CSO channels so that there was a vetting process. Uh, that was very important to maintain quality control. We also talked about some content works better on one channel versus another. Um, if some content was more fun in nature, potentially it could be shared as an Instagram story. So it was more fleeting and would only be present for 24 hours before it would come down. Um, we sent tips to all of our musicians about best, best practices for filming in your home. And for even some of them, we sent them equipment to help them actually make their own recordings like better quality microphones. 
and then we assisted them with editing and polishing the footage. Uh, one important point uh, when working with the musicians is that we asked them to select music that was in the public domain. Um, because otherwise, if, if a piece is under copyright, then we had to seek permissions, which takes a long time. Um, and it, as I mentioned at first, we got off to a little bit of a slow start, but then uh, one musician started, um, he basically layered in a video of him playing the bassoon with himself three times. <laughs> and then, so once a few musicians started the process, others kind of saw it, they felt more comfortable, and then they joined in the process. So we launched a new sort of campaign called CSO From Home, as videos have been rolling out over time. And we've seen some incredible results on Facebook. So um, some of the videos that we've launched um, have seen incredible stats. Um, the top performing one right now um, is a video of our assistant principal cello, Kenneth Olson, um, accompanied by Craig Terry on the piano, performing um, an arrangement of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah for cello and piano. And that video was posted, I think, on April 5th. Um, that video, since April 5th, has reached uh, almost 7.3 million people on Facebook. And it has uh, had over 3.1 million three-second video views and over 681,000 engagements. That video is now the number one performing video of all time on our social media properties. Uh, we were blown away in its success and how it sort of took off like wildfire and was shared by so many different people and organizations on Facebook. And when we looked at our Facebook insights, our stats, um, over the past 28 days, we've been able to, with this new content, uh, reach 10.9 million people on Facebook. Our posts, um, we've had engagement with 1.6 million people, over 5 million video views, and we've increased the followers on our page by almost 900% in the past 28 days. When we looked at our Facebook data from the past quarter, um, you know, we typically run organic and paid campaigns, and usually our organic posts don't go very far. Um, but with this new type of content, because it is resonating so well, it has blown our Facebook stats sort of out of the water, and our organic content is reaching more people than ever before. And this is helping us, you know, um, stay connected with audiences and build a fan base uh, worldwide that both um, inspires philanthropy, um, an affiliation with the organization, and hopefully will um, generate a new base of ticket buyers to come back once we're back on stage. So we've tried a couple of other initiatives on social media to stay connected with audiences. Um, one is we've tested out a new thing called Facebook Premiere, which some of you might be familiar with. It's similar to Facebook Live, but instead of airing a live video, you can actually air a pre-recorded video at a particular date and time. So this past Easter Sunday, um, we aired a, a video of Maestro Muti conducting Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The concert was actually recorded um, in September of 2014, um, but we premiered it on Facebook for the first time uh, Sunday. That video had already been on our YouTube channel and has been seen by over 21 million people. Um, but on Facebook, we premiered it. And what's unique about a Facebook premiere event is that it creates a community experience. Everyone, as they watch along with the video, can react to it with a like, a love. Um, and then there's a chat feed that everyone could chat along uh, with while they're watching the video. And we had so many people watching from all over the world. Um, and we actually participated in the chat both by providing sort of commentary of program notes um, throughout the broadcast, and then um, sort of appeals to support the CSO. Um, in addition to that, um, our Civic Orchestra of Chicago, our training orchestra, they were supposed to celebrate their 100th anniversary on March 29th uh, with a, a concert at Orchestra Hall. But because that concert could not take place, instead we planned a virtual concert and we filmed over 60 of those Civic musicians. They actually filmed themselves individually playing excerpts of a Tchaikovsky symphony, and then we layered all those videos together to create a virtual symphony. And you can view that on our social media channels and on YouTube as well. Um, a, a major difficulty that we're facing in terms of content is that, as I mentioned, we don't have the rights to share materials from our archives, which is why we don't have more full-length content. And that's something that we're negotiating right now uh, with the National Union. But as I said, we've seen incredible results on Facebook. Instagram is growing uh, like crazy. And then we're pumping out all this content um, for people that might not follow us on social media through a weekly email. 
So every Thursday, we're sending a sort of a weekly digest, a content roundup email of all the new things that uh, we're launching, and that's going to our full email database. In addition to that, uh, we launched a new radio broadcast series in Chicago that's airing locally on WFMT, which is our great classical music uh, radio station partner here in Chicago. And it's a new series that airs um, on Tuesday nights, um, and it's from the archives, uh, Maestro's Choice, where Maestro Riccardo Muti, who is home in Ravenna, Italy right now, um, personally selected um, six programs that are airing um, locally on the radio, and you can listen to those on demand as well. So while we can't be together in Orchestra Hall, um, we're providing ways both on the radio and online for our audiences to come together and to connect around a shared musical experience. That's great. Um, I think I'm going to ask the same question again, uh, which is, now that you've seen the kind of impact that uh, uh, content of, of various levels of seriousness and various levels of sort of intimate secrets of the CSO musicians, um, will it affect your content strategy moving forward? I definitely think it will because I think um, the videos that we're seeing now, you really develop a personal connection with the musicians and that's something that we really want to continue. Um, the one thing I think we'll definitely want to change is thinking about our staff structure and the way our team um, is set up best to create and to disseminate this content. So that's something I was thinking about before the coronavirus hit and now I'm thinking about it even more now that we need to have our team more aligned to produce this type of content and to reach people in a digital space. Well, the cool thing is that there are orchestras right across Canada that are reaching this, a similar conclusion. Uh, the reskilling in a very short period of time has been pretty spectacular to observe. So I, I want to ask the the learning question uh, and the, the yeah what what are you learning along the way and what has surprised you about any of the things that have gone on since you first learned that putting on public concerts at the hall would not be an option. Sure, and this and this just ties to what we were just talking about a little bit as well. Um, you know, I think we all often worry about our patrons or donors disengaging or worse yet, you know, unsubscribing from emails or social media channels. Uh, one thing that's been really interesting that we've learned here is that patrons thresholds for what is constitutes too much information. It is much higher uh, than it was before the shutdown period. Um, in fact, they're often responding to us of you cannot communicate enough with us. They comment that they've seen every little piece, every cat paw video, the concerts, the video series, and they want more. Um, so, you know, open rates for emails are much higher, continue requests for more things. And again, this is partly a product of people being at home a lot more of the time. Um, but they've pretty much given us a free pass on the too much nudging and being annoying, and we are jumping in that opportunity. Um, and, you know, one example that ties to what you were talking about just before uh, of things we've learned that we don't want to give up going forward, um, our civic orchestra that you just heard about, our, our professional training orchestra. Um, so rather than sending out the normal, normal handwritten note cards to all of their scholarship donors that we have them do each year, we gave all of them the task this year of making a short little video with some parameters, talk, short little message, specifically to the people that sponsored you, um, what you're doing, talk about how you're holding up here in the interim, and then just play a few seconds of something. So I just got yesterday this whole raft of all these videos that are done that we're gonna, the gift officers are gonna send out to their donors. It's just moving. I mean, I almost got teary because these are just kids in their little apartments, in their sweatshirts, civic orchestra sweatshirts, and they're just talking and playing to these donors. These are gonna be priceless to these donors. So I don't ever wanna go back on this one. This is, they know how to do it. They're wired to do it. Our professional players can do this. So that's just a good example of, of the kind of things we wanna keep doing in our learning. Um, and also one thing we, I think I'm learning in my team, um, normally you, know, you have to be careful with how much information flows around a large institution, but we're having to, in this quick pace mode we're in with our new crisis messaging kit, I'm having to share more information with my team at all levels, but make sure we all understand the right levels of discretion. I want them to have hard facts to share with particular large donors or institutional donors that would appreciate 
really detailed insider information and finances, but then not broadcast that in more general vehicles we use. So teaching and learning with each other, trust and discretion with sensitive information has also proved really effective and created more volume that we can do. Yeah, I think something that we've been sort of dealing with and that's been surprising to us is how to deal with uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty of when we'll be back on stage, um, you know, how long concerts will be canceled. Um, we uh, issued our first cancellation on March 12th. I think it was a Thursday night. Um, we were scheduled to have a concert that evening at eight o'clock and it was sold out. And we were at five o'clock all gathered in a conference room watching a press conference with our governor and mayor. And at five o'clock, um, they basically said that they were going to be mandating a ban on public gatherings. And we had one hour to issue a cancellation and to notify patrons that were coming to the hall that night. And amazingly, we got the word out and only a few people made it to the hall that evening. But um, since then, uh, we've had a stay at home order issued through April 30th, and we expect that that will be uh, extended past that date. So our team has had to really adjust to figure out what do we do? Um, do we pull our advertising campaigns? Do we work ahead? Should we be marketing future concerts? Um, we're adjusting, as I said, to trying to promote digital content. And what are we going to do with our subscription campaigns? Looking at our results, our subscription numbers are significantly behind. Um, where they need to be at this point in the campaign. And what was surprising is that our patrons weren't responding to us right away. Um, as I said earlier, after we uh, issued concert cancellations, um, in the past we've had uh, patrons call us and our phones were ringing off the hook. People want to know what to do with their tickets. But this year it was eerily quiet. And as I, as I talked about earlier, we gave our patrons options of what they would like to do with their tickets. So for the patrons that we had not yet heard from, earlier this week, we launched a new web form and sent patrons an email and encouraged them to consider converting the value of their tickets into a donation to the organization. So even though we would lose it as earned revenue, it would stay with the company as a contribution and stay in this fiscal year. So we sent an email to those patrons earlier this week and in two days, um, they basically went to a survey web form, filled out options that then connected back into their account in Tessitura. And in two days, we had an overwhelming response. Um, and uh, let's see, 44% uh, of those respondents said they would consider making a donation to the company. So we were really surprised and blessed by the generosity of those patrons. Um, one other thing that we've been having to sort of adjust with is our use of technology. Uh, and I talked about earlier how we're all using Teams and Zoom now, but um, we were a company that still has, we still have uh, old telephones in our office. Um, we were working on a plan to migrate all of our tele, uh, telecom uh, systems into the cloud that wasn't yet done. Luckily the marketing team was a, a guinea pig and we had moved all of our files from shared drives into the Microsoft cloud. So it just makes um, working remotely much, much easier. Um, so we were very thankful that we had done that using SharePoint, OneDrive. Um, but a big adjustment was also in our, with our sales and ticketing staff. So our box office and our phone room had to figure out how to operate remotely and how our individual callers could accept patron phone calls from their homes um, and making sure that they all had secure internet connections, they could answer a phone call, um, access Tessitura, and potentially take credit card information. So we had a lot of conversations about security, um, PCI compliance, um, so on and so forth. Jeff, have you had any surprises? <laughs> Including the fact that I just posed that question. Yes, this, this question is the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest surprise um, has been the, the renewed positive relationship with the members of the orchestra. Um, you know, every orchestra has a different relationship. Every orchestral institution has a different relationship with its musicians. Uh, we all try to make those relationships positive, and in some orchestras, they're more positive than others. Um, the tradition here in Chicago has been a pretty rough relationship over the past 80 years or more, um, and it was rough last year with the strike. Um, but I think this has, uh, if there's a positive that's coming out of all of this, it's it's the fact that uh, the musicians feel as though uh, they might have felt it before, but they never said it. 
but now they're saying it how much they appreciate what the trustees and the staff are, are doing for them um, and how we're all cooperating with each other. So that's been a nice surprise to come out of this. And I think that will carry forward as well once this is, uh, once this is all over. Um, I've not been surprised at how wonderful the staff has been and how they've, uh, as I said before, risen to the occasion. Um, uh, the trustees are a little more quiet than I think uh, I expected them to be. Um, I'm sure they're all dealing with their own personal experiences, uh, their, own, their own personal finances. Um, but in fact, I'd rather have it that way than to have them uh, uh, meddling in the details uh, too much. So um, I guess the, the biggest surprise is, is the, uh, the improved relationship uh, with, the, uh, with the orchestra. Great. I'd like to roll on to the last prepared question now, if I may, and talk about staffing strategies. Some Canadian orchestras have kept staff on, uh, in some cases at reduced wages. Others have laid off staff and are contemplating bringing team members back as government programs kick in. What has the CSO's approach been overall with specific reference to the development and marketing teams? Yes, I'll, maybe I'll talk to this a bit, but there's nothing different that we've done with the development and marketing teams than we've done with everybody else. Um, as Ryan mentioned on March 12th, um, we had a very short period of time to deal with uh, a canceled concert and, and the initial mandate from the mayor that night and the governor were, was a 30 day a ban on large public gatherings. Um, I quickly consulted with our board chair uh, and you know, it, on March 12th, we were all, at least I was certainly far more naive about what was to come. Uh, we had no idea and we thought, my God, a 30 day ban on uh, public gatherings, that'll probably be the extent of it. So I, I had a quick conversation with our chair and we agreed that I would send a message uh, or in the message that I sent to the orchestra telling them not to come to the hall that night and that the concerts would be canceled for the next 30 days within that message to give them some comfort. I added that uh, we would uh, sustain their compensation and benefits at 100% during the period. Uh, sent a similar message to the staff. Um, and, and there are a lot of people involved. So there's the staff, there's the chorus, there's the orchestra, there's the civic orchestra, or, which are on stipends. Uh, the ushers, since we own and operate our hall, these are all our employees. Um, and then about three days later, the governor extended that mandate to an eight week uh, ban. Um, which goes through uh, May 10th. Then we started thinking, my goodness, can we really sustain this at 100% uh, for such a long time and, and perhaps longer? So we, we did a financial analysis of, of uh, how large a deficit we would have if we, if, we, uh, if we did this, if we sustained everybody at 100% uh, through May 10th, and, and if we sustained everybody at 100% through the end of our fiscal year, which is June 30, the numbers are staggering. Um, so we put a uh, few concepts together for the executive committee of the board to consider, um, which included our recommendation that we reduce compensation by, um, to the orchestra by 20%, uh, same for all of the other people I've described, uh, the senior managers, but then on a sliding scale for the rest of the staff from 15% to 5%. The interesting part with the orchestra is that there's a force majeure clause in, in, in our contract with them. So we, we could have just said, sorry, uh, we're not going to pay you anything. And we would have been within our legal rights. Um, but uh, the executive committee contemplated what we were proposing to them and, and they accepted it. Um, so we, we are currently sustaining all of our full-time employees um, at uh, basically an 80% level. We did, uh, or not yet, but the end of this month will be uh, furloughing our, uh, most of our part-time people, which includes our usher, usher staff, uh, ushering staff. We also, in the agreement with the orchestra, um, made it clear that we could sustain this through the end of June. Uh, there might have to be further reductions beginning in July, depending on what happened with the, uh, the summer season. Um, so that's where we are right now. And, um, you know, not every organization is in a position to do this. You know, we, it's clear we're going to have a, a multi 
multi-million dollar deficit at the end of this year. Uh, fortunately, we have enough cash reserves to, to cover that. Um, I know there are, there are other U.S. orchestras that um, have already laid everybody off, um, others that have made slightly deeper cuts than that, and others that haven't made any cuts because they have enough of a cash reserve. So it depends on your cash reserve, on your line of credit. Um, none of us want to go into our endowment funds uh, for this. And uh, so I think that the tougher question will come uh, in July, and an even tougher question will come in September if we're unable to present concerts then. Right. I, I mean, I, the mind boggles, and, and I think everyone on the call today understands what you're going through and uh, is, is doing similar uh, yeah. math. It, it is, uh, people feel very responsible for the organizations whose health and, and artistry they steward. And I, I, this has been a, a tremendously challenging time for all. What I would like to do at this point is roll over into the chat box and see what we've turned up by way of questions. And um, I want to start with, an, with one that I think is relatively uncomplex, uh, given the deep places we just went. Uh, let's, uh, and I'll also remind other people, if you have a question to pose, uh, plop it into the chat box and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can before uh, the call is done today. First question is, what proofing system are you using? Uh, the writer is uh, currently evaluating a few options and is curious as to what CSO is finding uh, useful. Sure, uh, we're using software called Workfront. Um, the proofing software used to be called Proof HQ, but it was absorbed by Workfront into their project management software. Um, so it's Workfront Proof. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm presuming that they can reach out to you if they've got deeper questions about this. Um, and I think this next question is really for Dale, but anyone can take it. And I think it's in response to your uh, comment about those patrons who are the ones who want to step up and help in a crisis. Um, knowing that that is who we should work to reach is good, but how do we actually identify them? Sure. <laughs> So this is where, you know, obviously, if you know them specifically within your major gift prospecting work, that's helpful, but you obviously aren't going to know a lot of those. You're simply going to have to take some leaps of faith and send donor messaging that reflects this optimism, um, and they will stop up. And this is what I talked about earlier. Don't worry about offending the ones where this isn't the right time. They'll tell you, they'll ignore, they'll, they won't be offended that you asked at all. Um, but I think you need to put messages out that suggest, you know, you're profiling who these people are and tailor messages to them as a group and these people will step up. Um, but yeah, just, it's all in the messaging. Don't be apologetic. Don't be, assume that you're trying to find that 10 or 20 or 30 or 40% of people that really are looking for a way to help because they love your orchestras and ignore everything else and tailor the messages to that. Great, thank you. Another question that came up on the subject of uh, asking and pitching uh, your organization within the maelstrom of need in our communities right now. Uh, a suggestion or a question, is there a place for us as orchestras to advocate for others, helping to demonstrate our place in the wider community during a time of need and crisis? You know, I. Get, get, I, I assume this refers to more joining in a little bit more community-wide global pursuits so. of, of improving philanthropy. Um, you know, that is often best done. I mean, already just in Chicago and Illinois, there's this Arts Illinois group, a couple different groups have assembled. The foundation communities in particular um, have really come together to create community-wide initiatives. They're much better equipped to do that. Um, so I think partnering up with places like that that are the funders already and also have access to others, um, civic leadership that can help drive a bigger purpose and much larger resources, that's where to go for that. I think in these organizations, again, I think you, you really do need to focus hard on advocating just to your, your community um, and partnering with these other places as they prepare this. It's hard to drive that. Um, particularly the arts community. And one of the things I'll tell you that we found locally, the arts initiatives that have emerged have been focused on very small grassroots arts organizations 
even though they were devised under the pretense of supporting the larger arts organizations that drive economic impact in our communities, but the funding has almost all gone to very grassroots organizations and artists. So a lot of dissonance going on there right now in so many of these initiatives. Okay, thank you for that. Now the next question may be focused on Jeff, but I, I suspect that you both have some thoughts on this. Are you concerned that your patrons will be uncomfortable about coming back to the concert hall? And how will you sustain your momentum and the organization revenue stream if no one comes, even if you are permitted to open the doors again to the hall? How are you thinking about that from a, a planning perspective and also from a messaging perspective? Well, I think, I think we'll let Jeff answer this one, but I think we have all agreed doing endless cat videos is probably not gonna be the long-term solution here. That's right. Um, we are thinking about that. Uh, we don't have the answer. And um, of course, nobody has the answer. And uh, you know, frankly, we're just trying to get through the current period right now. We've had some internal discussions about what we might do uh, starting in the fall. Uh, but I, I think we all have to be prepared. We're not prepared sitting here today, but we have to figure out how to be prepared. Let's say, and I, and I know for many uh, uh, Canadian orchestras and many U.S. orchestras, uh, the concert season is would have been ending around now anyway, or in, in mid in mid May. Ours happens to go until the end of June, um, so we're hanging on that you know, maybe we could still get a couple of weeks of concerts in the end of June, although that's becoming less and less likely. But yes, what will we do if we're allowed to put concerts on again starting in September, um, and you know? We only get 25% of ticket sales that we would typically get. Um, I think that will be, uh, you know, our next major decision. You know, how can we possibly financially sustain that? Um, to me, I think the question is how long do we think that will last? And, you know, it, it won't last forever. I think we have to keep that in mind. There, there will come a time when a vaccine is invented. There will come a time when it will be perfectly safe to gather in large crowds again. The, the challenge and where we have to be strategic in our thinking and in our actions is how do we survive to that point? Is it holding on for another three or four months or is it holding on for another 18 months? Um, and if it's the latter, we just have to think about how we can do that and for each organization, uh, it will be different. Right, now we have a couple of other questions but I also recognize we've got about uh, 30 seconds prior to our promised wrap up time. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest, uh, if Dale, Ryan and Jeff are willing, is if I can pose those questions uh, to them in a, offline and uh, share responses uh, with, with the group as part of the notes that we will be circulating after the meeting. Uh, but we are right on 2.30 right now. This has been truly a stunning and generous 60 minutes of uh, call and response deep thought and a lot of inspiration. And I'm so grateful to you, Jeff, for responding positively in the first place when I reached out. And for the, <laughs> um, <laughs> my heart, uh, I, I must say, uh, is, is beating a little faster when I just saw that. But to have a chance to meet Ryan and, and Dale as well at, at a time like this one is, is a pretty amazing treat. So, uh, thank you to the team from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Know that we're sending you all our best and that we're very grateful to you. Thanks, everyone. Our pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Our pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you.